In our last episode, we investigated the crimes of King David, both his crime of adultery and his crime of murder. In this episode, we want to examine the crimes committed by members of David's family, as the prophet Nathan had prophesied would happen. The Bible is incredibly interconnected with threads that run through it from beginning to end. In this podcast, I will uncover these threads, help you dig deeper into God's truth, and inspire you to live your life with greater confidence and joy. Welcome to Bible Threads with me, Dr. Bruce Becker. Let's start with Joab, the general of David's army. We were introduced to Joab in our last episode. Recall that Joab was family. He was King David's nephew. Let's start at the beginning of Joab's story. He appeared on the scene when David became the ruler of Judah. David became Judah's king after the death of King Saul and his three sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. The northern region of Israel did not accept David as king. Instead, they anointed one of Saul's remaining sons, Ishbosheth, to be king in the north. Ishbosheth was 40 years old when he became king. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, we read about a battle at Gibeon, a town located about 100 miles northwest of Jerusalem. In this battle, David's men were victorious over Ishbosheth's army, led by General Abner who had long been King Saul's general. Also at this battle were Joab and his two brothers, Abishai and Ashael. Near the end of the battle, as Abner's soldiers were retreating, Ashael pursued General Abner. Abner called out to Ashael, Stop chasing me! Why should I strike you down? How could I look your brother Joab in the face? But Ashael did not stop his pursuit of Abner. And so reluctantly, Abner turned to confront Ashael and killed him by thrusting the butt of his spear into Ashael's gut. Now, Joab would never forget who it was that killed his brother. Joab and Abner remain mortal enemies from this day forward. The conflict between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time, more than seven years. As time went on, David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Then something happened that caused General Abner to switch his allegiance from King Ishbosheth to King David. One day, Ishbosheth accused Abner of sleeping with one of King Saul's concubines. Now, a, a concubine was a woman in a polygamous royal marriage who had less status than one of the king's actual wives. A second-class wife, you might say. It was a false accusation, and because of it, Abner swore an oath to transfer the house of Saul in the north to the house of David in the south, so that David would be king over all Israel and Judah. Abner then headed south to meet with King David in Hebron to offer his allegiance. David accepted the offer, and Abner returned to the north to rally the army and the people to accept David as their king. Just as Abner left Hebron, Joab returned from plundering a town. When Joab learned that Abner had come to Hebron and that David had accepted Abner's offer and sent him away in peace, Joab was angry. Joab accused Abner of being deceptive in trying to find out what King David's plans were. Then without David's knowledge, Joab sent messengers after Abner and his men and told them to return to Hebron. Abner returned, and when he arrived, Joab took him aside into the gateway of the city, as though he wanted to talk to Abner privately. But Joab didn't want to talk. Instead, he fatally stabbed Abner in the gut. In 2 Samuel chapter 3, 3, we read the summary of this day. Joab and his brother Abishai murdered Abner because he had killed their brother Ashael in the battle at Gibeon. And David mourned the death of Abner. At the age of 30, David became king over all of Israel. 
and would reign for 33 more years. One of his first tasks was to capture the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusite people. The Jebusites were descendants of Noah's son Ham and his grandson Canaan. In David's day, the Jebusites were one of the Amorite tribes known for their detestable worship practices. With the capture of Jerusalem, David made it the capital city, and he built a palace there. The next time we hear about Joab was what we learned about in our last episode, David's crimes of adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah the Hittite. As we discovered, Joab carried out the details of Uriah's death and was complicit in it. Before we continue with the story of David's nephew, Joab, let's uncover the crimes involving three of David's children, Amnon, Tamar, and Absalom. Absalom and Tamar were brother and sister. Amnon was a half-brother, because although he was David's son, he was the son of a different mother. Amnon was in love with his half-sister, Tamar, who was described as being very beautiful. Amnon tried and tried to win the heart of Tamar, but was unsuccessful. He became frustrated, so much so that a friend of his noticed how despondent he was. This friend was Jonadab, another of King David's nephews, and that made him a cousin to Amnon. Jonadab convinced his cousin to share what was bothering him. When Jonadab heard Amnon's story, he suggested a shrewd but dishonest plan. Go to bed and pretend to be ill. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so I may watch her and then eat from her hand. Long story short, the plan unfolded as Jonadab had devised it. When Tamar brought the food into Amnon's bedroom, he grabbed her. And when Tamar resisted, Amnon raped her. Amnon's pursuit of Tamar's love now turned into sheer hatred for her. He hated her more than he had loved her, so we are told. Amnon told her to get out. In fact, he had her thrown out. Tamar left and went to her brother Absalom. Tamar ended up living in Absalom's home as a desolate and disgraced woman. Absalom didn't say anything to Amnon about his crime. He didn't confront him at least not for the next two years. Two years later, when Absalom's sheep shearers were shearing sheep, say that ten times real fast, not too far from Jerusalem, Absalom invited his father and all of his brothers to come there. King David declined, but gave Absalom his blessing. Absalom specifically requested that Amnon come, which David really questioned. In the end, all of David's sons went to visit their brother Absalom. At this sheep-shearing party, Absalom instructed his men to wait until Amnon had plenty to drink and was in high spirits, and then kill him, which they did. Absalom murdered his brother Amnon because he had raped his sister Tamar. It was a crime two years in the making. When Amnon was dead... All of the other sons of David got on their mules and headed back to Jerusalem. People tend not to stick around crime scenes. While they were on their way home, a messenger brought a report to David that Absalom had returned all of the king's sons, not, had murdered all of the king's sons. Before he was totally overwhelmed with grief, however, Jonadab, Amnon's cousin, reported to his uncle David what actually happened. Only Amnon was murdered. And David mourned the death of Amnon. After Absalom had murdered Amnon, he fled to Geshur, a region in Israel on the east side of the Jordan River. The people who lived there were known as Geshurites, a group of Canaanite people that had been allowed to remain after Joshua divided the land into the twelve tribes. Today, this region is known as the Golan Heights. Absalom likely fled to Geshur because it was the hometown of his mother, Maaka. Maaka was the daughter of the Geshurite king, whom David had taken to be one of his wives. We learn from 2 Samuel that Absalom stayed in Geshur for three years. 
King David mourned for his son Amnon for a time, but he eventually got to the point where he longed to see his wayward but favorite son Absalom. Joab was well aware that David wanted to see his favorite son, so he devised the ruse with a woman from Tekoa to get David to pardon Absalom and allow him to return to Jerusalem. David saw through the ruse and instinctively knew that Joab was behind it. Even so, David instructed Joab to bring Absalom back to Jerusalem, which he did immediately. However, it would be another two years before David and Absalom were reunited and reconciled. As time went on, Absalom developed a real thirst for power, influence, and popularity. He acquired for himself a chariot with horses and paraded around town with 50 men who accompanied him. He'd also get up early and stand by the road leading into the city. If people had an issue that they wanted a king's official to resolve, Absalom would tell them, There isn't anyone to hear your concerns. If only I were judge in Israel. Absalom began to undermine his father's authority and began to win the hearts of the people of Israel by pretending he cared for them. Absalom reminds me of a power-hungry, shrewd politician, which I guess he was. Long story short, Absalom conspired against his father, built up an army, instituted a propaganda campaign to win the hearts of people, so much so that people throughout Israel declared Absalom to be king in Hebron. Hebron was a city just 20 miles south of Jerusalem. When word came to King David that the hearts of men of Israel were with Absalom, David and those loyal to him fled the city of Jerusalem. As David fled the city, he experienced a really low point in his life. He was cursed by a member of Saul's clan named Shimei, who also pelted David with rocks and dirt. King David was on the run. There are two men we should also mention, men who deserted David to serve Absalom. One was Ahithophel, whom we met in our last episode. Ahithophel was David's chief advisor, and recall he was the grandfather of Bathsheba. The Bible doesn't tell us his motives for abandoning the king, but it, it seems reasonable that he harbored anger and resentment because of what David did to his granddaughter and to her husband Uriah. The other man that I want to mention was a personal friend of David's, a man by the name of Hushai. When Absalom asked Hushai why he had abandoned his friend, the King David, Hushai revealed that just as he had served David, so now he wanted to serve the son. Long live King Absalom, he said. Hushai seemed to have been looking out for himself and his political future. We do get a bit of a window into Ahithophel's heart when Absalom asked him to give him his best advice. Ahithophel said, Lie with your father's concubines whom he left to take care of the palace. Then all Israel will hear that you made yourself a stench in your father's nostril, and the hands of everyone will, uh, with you will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and he lay with his father's concubines, in the sight of Israel. Recall from our last episode that the prophet Nathan specifically said this would happen. And there's a tinge of irony, don't you think, that Absalom committed these acts of sexual revenge on the very same rooftop that David had first observed Bathsheba bathing. Absalom also asked Ahithophel for a battle strategy against David and his men. Ahithophel suggested an immediate strike against David, kill David, and then spare the lives of all who were with David. Seemed like a good plan. But then Absalom asked for a battle strategy from Hushai. Hushai advised taking some time to recruit more soldiers from all over Israel and then go after David. What happened next is a window into Hushai's heart. In the event that Absalom would go with Ahithophel's advice to hit David hard and hit him that very day, Hushai sent two priests to find David and warned him to cross over the Jordan River immediately. 
David and his men did cross the Jordan and headed to a place called Mahanaim, near the Jabbok River. By the way, Mahanaim is mentioned one other time in the Old Testament. It is when Jacob returned to meet his brother Esau. Jacob and his clan spent the night at Mahanaim. And it's also the place where Jacob wrestled with God. What Hushai did in sending the two priests to find David revealed that he was still loyal to David and was acting as a friend and really as a double agent. God used Hushai to frustrate the advice of Ahithophel. And when Ahithophel saw that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He put his house in order and then hanged himself. Add suicide to the growing list of tragic events. Absalom and his men had pursued David across the Jordan River and camped in Gilead, not too far from David and his men. David prepared his army to attack Absalom. He divided his army into three battalions, with Joab leading one battalion, Abishai, Joab's brother, leading the second, and Ittai, the third. Interestingly, Ittai was from the Philistine city of Gath, making him a Gittite. By the way, the Philistine giant Goliath, he also was a Gittite. David's plan was to march out with his generals, but they advised him not to. The risk was too great that he would be captured and killed. Because the only thing Absalom really wanted was to see his father dead, so he could ascend to the throne. In contrast, David told his generals, Be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. The battle took place in the forest of Ephraim with Absalom's army being defeated by David's men. It was a fierce battle with 20,000 casualties. As Absalom retreated with his army, the mule he was riding went under a large oak tree with low-hanging branches. We read elsewhere that Absalom was known to have long, thick hair. It got tangled in the tree. His mule kept going, leaving Absalom hanging in midair. One of David's soldiers saw Absalom hanging in the oak tree and reported this to Joab. Jo Joab was incredulous that the soldier hadn't killed him. But the soldier had to remind Joab about King David's instructions not to harm Absalom. Joab didn't care. He took three javelins and went and found Absalom. Joab plunged all three javelins into Absalom's heart. Then he had his men take down the king's son dug a pit in the forest, and buried Absalom under a pile of rocks. Joab directly disobeyed his king and in doing so murdered Absalom. And David mourned the death of Absalom. Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Because Joab had willfully disobeyed the king's order, David demoted Joab and relieved him of his rank as commander of the army. In Joab's place, David appointed another one of his nephews, a man by the name of Amasa. As a nephew, Amasa also then was Joab's cousin. Nepotism was pretty common in the ancient world. David returned to his palace in Jerusalem after the battle, but his troubles weren't over. Another rebel named Sheba led the northern parts of Israel to revolt against David as king. He said, We have no share in David, no part in Jesse's son. Every man to his tent, O Israel. So David summoned his army to pursue Sheba immediately to put down this rebellion. The army headed north and arrived in Gibeon. Recall earlier it was at Gibeon where King Ishbosheth's army, under the command of Abner, had been routed by David's army. On this occasion, Joab approached Amasa, his commander, as to welcome him with a brotherly kiss. Amasa was not on his guard. Joab said to Amasa, How are you, my brother? Then Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him, and then he took a dagger in his left hand and plunged it into Amasa's gut. And without being stabbed again, Amasa died 
at the hand of his cousin Joab. As King David was nearing the end of his life, there is one more story of treachery we need to look at. There was another one of David's sons, a man by the name of Adonijah. Adonijah was David's fourth son, born shortly after Absalom was born. One day, Adonijah decided that he wanted to be king, even though his father was still alive. Adonijah conferred with Joab and with Abiathar the priest. Abiathar, by the way, was one of the priests that the double agent Hushai sent to warn David about Absalom's battle strategy. Joab and Abiathar supported the would-be king Adonijah. When word about Adonijah's self-made kingship reached those loyal to David, they all acted decisively. David had decades earlier promised to Bathsheba that her son Solomon would succeed David as king. David immediately gave the order that Solomon should be anointed as king. And so he was taken to Gihon, where Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon as king. When Adonijah and his supporters heard that David anointed Solomon as the next king, they all fled. Adonijah fled to the temple and appealed for clemency by taking hold of the altar. Solomon allowed his half-brother Adonijah to live as long as he made no further trouble. But Adonijah did not stop scheming. In the end, Solomon had Adonijah executed, along with Joab, because he had murdered two of David's commanders, Abner and Amasa, and it was done during peacetime. He also removed Abiathar as priest for his role in Adonijah's coup attempt. What a tragic story of treachery. Murder, rape, another murder, a suicide, and another two murders, all transpiring from David's original crimes of adultery and murder. Our takeaway from this episode is clear. Sin has consequences, even among a man who is a man after God's own heart. We ought never to take sin lightly. It needs to be confessed, repented of, and forgiven, which our gracious God wants to do because of what His Son, Jesus, did for us. True Crimes, Bible Edition. In our next episode, we'll look at another murder actually an assassination, which the Lord himself sanctioned. If you have any thoughts or questions about this uh, podcast, please email me at bruce at timeofgrace.org. And did you know that we recently added two new podcasts to our podcast library? Both are by Pastor Jeremy, Evening Encouragement and Bible Breath. Check them out. And thanks for listening, and God bless.